This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victoria Long. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. Translated by Richard Crawley. Book 7, Chapter 21. 18th and 19th year of the war. Arrival of Gallippus at Syracuse. Fortification of Declia. Successes of the Syracusans. After refitting their ships, Gallippus and Python coasted along from Tarentin to Epizephrian, Locris. They now received the more correct information that Syracuse was not yet completely invested, but that it was still possible for an army arriving at Epipolae to effect an entrance, and they consulted accordingly whether they should keep Sicily on their right and risk sailing in by sea, or leaving it on their left. Should they first sail to Himera, and taking with them the Himerians, and any other th that might agree to join them, go to Syracuse by land? Finally they determined to sail for Himera, especially as the fourth Athenian ships which Nisus had at length sent off, on hearing that they were at Locris, had not yet arrived at Regium. Accordingly, before these reached their post, the Peloponnesians crossed the strait and, after touching at Regium and Messina, came to Himera. Arrived there, they persuaded the Himerians to join in the war, and not only to go with them themselves, but to provide arms for seamen from their vessels with which they had drawn ashore at Himera. And they sent and appointed a place for the Selenuntines to meet with them with all their forces. A few troops were also promised by the Geloans and some of the Sicils, who were now ready to join with them with much greater alacrity, owing to the recent death of Arconidas, a powerful Sicil king in that neighborhood, and friendly to Athens, and owing also to the vigor shown by Gallippus in coming of the Lacedaemonians. Gallippus now took with him about seven hundred of his sailors and marines, that number only having arms, a thousand heavy infantry, and light troops from Himera, with a body of a hundred horse, some light troops and cavalry from Silenus, a few Geloans and Sicils numbering a thousand in all, and set out on his march for Syracuse. Meanwhile, the Corinthian fleet from Lucas made all haste to arrive, and one of their commanders, Gongillus, started last with a single ship, was the first to reach Syracuse a little before Gallippus. Gongillus found the Syracusans on the point of holding an assembly to consider where they should put an end to the war. This he prevented, and reassured them by telling them that more vessels were still to arrive, and that Gallippus, son of Cleandrius, had been dispatched by the Lacedaemonians to take the command. Upon this the Syracusans took courage, and immediately marched out with all their forces to meet Gallippus, who they found was now close at hand. Meanwhile, Gallippus, after taking Eate, a fort at Sicils, on his way, formed an army in order of the battle and so arrived at Epipolae, and ascending by Euryalus, as the Athenians had done at first, now advanced with the Syracusans against the Athenian lines. His arrival chanced at a critical moment. The Athenians had already finished a double wall of six or seven furlongs to the great harbor, with the exception of a small portion next to the sea, with which they were still engaged upon, and in the remainder of the circle towards Troglius on the other sea, stones had been laid ready for the building for the greater part of the distance, and some points had been left half finished, while others were entirely completed. The danger of Syracuse had indeed been great. Meanwhile, the Athenians, recovering from the confusion into which they had been first thrown by the sudden battle of Gallippus and the Syracusans, formed an order of battle. Gallippus halted at the short distance off, and sent on a herald to tell them that, if they would evacuate Sicily with a bag and baggage within five days' time, he was willing to make a truce accordingly. The Athenians treated this proposition with contempt, and dismissed the herald without an answer. After this both sides began to prepare for action. Gallippus, observing that the Syracusans were in disorder and did not easily fall into line, drew off his troops more into the open ground, while Nicias, did not lead the Athenians, but lay still by his own wall. When Gallippus saw that they did not, he led off his army to the citadel of the quarter of Apollo Temanites, and passed the night there. On the following day he led out the main body of his army, and drawing them up in order of battle before the walls of the Athenians to prevent their going to the relief of any other quarter, dispatched a strong force against Fort Labdalum, 
and took it, and put all whom he found in it to the sword, the place not being within sight of the Athenians. On the same day an Athenian galley that lay moored off the harbour was captured by the Syracusans. After this the Syracusans and their allies began to carry a single wall, starting from the city in a slanted direction up Epipole, in order that the Athenians, unless they could hinder the work, might be no longer able to invest them. Meanwhile the Athenians, having now finished their wall down to the sea, had come up to the heights, and part of their wall being weak, Gallippus drew out his army by night and attacked it. However, the Athenians who happened to be bivouacking outside took the alarm and came out to meet him, upon seeing which he quickly led his men back again. The Athenians now built their wall higher, and in future kept guard at this point themselves, disposing their confederates along the remainder of the works, as the stations assigned to them. Nicias also determined to fortify Plemirium, a promontory over against the city, which juts out and narrows the mouth of the great harbour. He thought that the fortification of this place would make it easier to bring in supplies, as they would be able to carry on their blockade from a less distance near to the port occupied by the Syracusians, instead of being obliged upon every moment of the enemy's navy, to put out against them from the bottom of the great harbour. Besides this, he now began to pay more attention to the war by sea, seeing that the coming of Gallippus had diminished their hopes by land. Accordingly, he conveyed over his ships and some troops, and built three forts in which he placed most of his baggage, and moored there for the larger craft and men of war. This was the first and chief occasion of the losses which the crews experienced. The water which they used was scarce, and had to be fetched from far, and the sailors could not go out for firewood without being cut off from the Syracusan horse, who were masters of the country. A third of the enemy's cavalry was being stationed at the little town of Olympium to prevent plundering incursions on the part of the Athenians at Plemurium. Meanwhile, Nicias learned that the rest of the Corinthian fleet was approaching and sent twenty ships to watch for them, with orders to be on the lookout for them about Locris and Regium and the approach to Sicily. Gallippus, meanwhile, went on with the wall across a pripole, using the stones which the Athenians had laid down for their own wall, and at the same time constantly led out the Syracusans and their allies, and formed them in order of battle in front of the lines, the Athenians forming against him. At last he thought that the moment was come, and began the attack, and a hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued between the lines, with where the Syracusan cavalry could be of no use, and the Syracusans and their allied were defeated and took up their dead under truce, while the Athenians erected a trophy. After this, Gallippus called the soldiers together and said that the fault was not theirs, but his. He had kept their lines too much within the works, and he had thus deprived them of the service of their cavalry and darters. He would now, therefore, lead them on a second time. He begged them to remember that in material force they would be fully a match for their opponents, while with respect to moral advantages it were intolerable if Peloponnesians and Dorians could not feel comfort of incoming Ionians and islanders with the motley rabble that accompanied them and of driving them out of the country. After this he embraced the first opportunity that offered of again leading them against the enemy. Now Nicias and the Athenians held the opinion that even if the Syracusans should not wish to offer battle, it was necessary for them to prevent the building of the cross wall, as it already almost overlapped the extreme point of their own, and if it went any further it would from that moment make no difference whether they fought ever so many successful actions or never fought at all. They accordingly came out to meet the Syracusans. Gallippus led out his heavy infantry further from the fortifications than on the former occasion, and so joined battle, posting his horse and darters upon the flank of the Athenians in the open space where the works of the two walls terminated. During the engagement, the cavalry attacked and routed the left wing of the Athenians, which was opposed to them, and the rest of the Athenian army was in consequence defeated by the Syracusans and driven headlong within their lines. The night following, the Syracusans carried the wall up to the Athenian works, and passed them, thus putting it out of their power any longer to stop them, and depriving them, even if victorious in the field, of all chance of investing the city for future use. After this, the remaining twelve vessels of the Corinthians, Ambrosiots and Leucadians, sailed into the harbor under the command of Erasinides.
a Corinthian having eluded the Athenian ships on guard and helping the Syracusans in completing the remainder of the cross wall. Meanwhile, Gallippus went into the rest of Sicily to raise the land and naval forces, and also to bring over any of the cities that either were lukewarm in cause or had hitherto kept out of the war altogether. Syracusan and Corinthian envoys were also dispatched to Lacedaemon and Corinth to get fresh force sent over in any way that might offer either in merchant vessels or transports or in any other manner likely to prove successful, as the Athenians were too sending for reinforcements, while the Syracusans proceeded to man a fleet and to exercise, meaning to try their fortune in this way also, and generally became exceedingly confident. Nicias perceiving this, and seeing the strength of the enemy and his own difficulties daily increasing, himself also sent to Athens. He had before sent frequent reports of events as they occurred, and felt it especially incumbent upon him to do so now, as he thought that they were in a critical position, and that unless speedily recalled or strongly reinforced from home, they had no hope of safety. He feared, however, that the messengers, either through inability to speak or through failure of memory, or from a wish to please the multitude, might not report to the truth and so thought it best to write a letter, and ensure that the Athenians should know his own opinion without it being lost in transmission, and be able to decide upon the real facts of the case. His emissaries accordingly departed with the letter and the requisite verbal instructions, and he attended to the affairs of the army, making it his aim now to keep on the defensive and to avoid any unnecessary danger. At the close of the same summer, the Athenian general Eutian marched in concert with Perdiccas, with a large body of Thracians against Amphipolis, and failing to take it, brought some galleys round into the Strymon, and blockaded the town from the river, having his base at Hymerium. Summer was now over, the winter ensuing. The persons sent by Nicias reaching Athens gave the verbal message that had been entrusted to them, and answered any questions that were asked of them, and delivered the letter. The clerk of the city came forward and read out to the Athenians the letter, which was as follows. Our past operations, Athenians, have been made known to you by many other letters. It is now time for you to become equally familiar with our present conditions and to take your measures accordingly. We had defeated in most of our engagements with them the Syracusans against whom we were sent, and we built the works which we now occupy, when Gallippus arrived from Lacedaemon with an army attained from Peloponnese and from some of the cities in Sicily. In our first battle with him we were victorious. In the battle on the following day we were overpowered by a multitude of cavalry and darters, and compelled to retire within our lines. We have now, therefore, been forced by the numbers of those opposed to us to discontinue the work of circumvallation and to remain inactive, being unable to make use even of all the force we have, since a large portion of our heavy infantry is absorbed in the defense of our lines. Meanwhile, the enemy has carried a single wall past our lines, thus making it impossible for us to invest them in future, until this cross wall be attacked by a strong force and captured so that the besieger in name has become, at least from the land side, the besieged in reality, as we are prevented by their cavalry from even going for any distance into the country. Besides this, an embassy has been dispatched to Peloponnese to procure reinforcements, and Gallippus has gone to the cities in Sicily, partly in the hope of inducing those that are at present neutral to join him in the war, partly of bringing from his allies additional contingents for the land forces and materials for the navy. For I understand that they contemplate a combined attack upon our lines with their land forces and with their fleet by sea. You must none of you be surprised that I say by sea also. They have discovered that the length of time we have now been in commission has rotted our ships and wasted our crew, and that with the entireness of our crew and the soundness of our ships, the pristine efficiency of our navy has departed. For it is impossible for us to haul our ships ashore and careen them, because the enemy's vessels being as many or more than our own, we are constantly anticipating an attack. Indeed, they may be seen exercising, and it lies with them to take the initiative, and not having to maintain a blockade, they have greater facilities for drying their ships. This we should scarcely be able to do, even if we had plenty of ships to spare, and we were freed from our present necessity of exhausting all our strength upon the blockade, for it is already difficult to carry in supplies past Syracuse, and we were to relax our vigilance in the slightest degree, 
it would become impossible. The losses which our crews have suffered and still continue to suffer arise from the following causes. Expeditions for fuel and for forage, and the distance from which water has to be fetched, cause our sailors to be cut off from the Syracusan cavalry. The loss of our previous superiority emboldens our slaves to desert. Our foreign seamen are impressed by the unexpected appearance of a navy against us, and the strength of the navy's resistance, such as them as were pressed into the service, take the first opportunity of departing to their respective cities, such as were originally seduced by the temptation of high pay, and expecting little fighting and large gains, leave us either the desertion to the army, or by availing themselves of one or other of the various facilities of escape which the magnitude of Sicily affords them. Some even engage in trade themselves, and prevail upon the captains to take Hycaric slaves on board in their place. Thus they have ruined the efficiency of our navy. Now I need not remind you that the time during which a crew is in its prime is short, and that the number of sailors who can start a ship on her way and keep the rowing in time is small. But by far my greatest trouble is that holding the post which I do, I am prevented by the natural indocility of the Athenian seamen from putting a stop to these evils, and that meanwhile we have no source from which to recruit our crews which the enemy can do from many quarters, but are compelled to depend both for supplying the crews in service and for making good our losses upon the men who were brought with us. For our present confederates, Naxos and Catana, are incapable of supplying us. There is only one thing more wanting to our opponents, I mean the defection of our Italian markets. If they were to see you neglect to relieve us from our present condition, and were to go over to the enemy, famine would compel us to evacuate, and Syracuse would finish the war without a blow. I mind it is true have written to you something different and more agreeable than this, but nothing certainly more useful, if it is desirable for you to know the real state of things here before taking your measures. Besides, I know that it is in your nature to love to be told the best side of things, and then to blame the teller if the expectations which he has raised in your minds are not answered by the result. And I therefore thought it safest to declare to you the truth. Now you are not to think that either your generals or your soldiers have ceased to be a match for the forces originally opposed to them, but you are to reflect that a general Sicilian coalition is being formed against us that a fresh army is expected from the Peloponnese, while the force we have here is unable to cope even with our present antagonists, and you must promptly decide either to recall us or to send us to another fleet an army as numerous again, with a large sum of money and someone to succeed me, as a disease in the kidneys unfits me for retaining my post. I have, I think, some claim on your indulgence, as while I was in my prime I did you much good service in my commands. But whatever you mean to do, do it at the commencement of spring and without delay, as the enemy will ob obtain his Sicilian reinforcements shortly, those from Peloponnese after a longer interval, and unless you attend to the matter, the former will be here before you, while the latter will elude you as they have done before. Such were the contents of Nicias's letter. When the Athenians had heard it, they refused to accept his resignation, but chose him two colleagues naming Menander and Euthydemus, two of the officers at the seat of war, to fill their places until their arrival, that Nicias might not be left alone with his sickness to bear the whole weight of affairs. They also voted to send out another army and navy, drawn partly from the Athenians on the muster roll, partly from the allies. The colleagues chosen for Nicias were Demosthenes, son of Alcisthenes, and Eurymedon, son of Thucles. Eurymedon was sent off at once about the time of winter solstice, with ten ships, a hundred and twenty talents of silver, and instructions to tell the army that reinforcements would arrive, and that care would be taken of them. But Demosthenes stayed behind to organize the expedition, meaning to start as soon as it was spring, and sent for troops to the allies, and meanwhile got together money, ships, and heavy infantry at home. The Athenians also sent twenty vessels from Peloponnese to prevent any one crossing over to Sicily from Corinth or Peloponnese. For the Corinthians, filled with confidence by the favorable alteration in Sicilian affairs which had been reported by the envoys upon their arrival, and convinced that the fleet which they had before sent out had not been without its use, were now preparing to dispatch a force of heavy infantry 
in merchant vessels to Sicily, while the Lacedaemonians did the like for the rest of the Peloponnese. The Corinthians also manned the fleet of twenty-five vessels, intending to try the result of a battle with the squadron on guard at Nalpactus, and meanwhile to make it less easy for the Athenians there to hinder the departure of their merchantmen by obliging them to keep an eye upon the galleys thus arrayed against them. In the meantime the Lacedaemonians prepared for their invasion of Attica, in accordance with their own previous resolve, and at the instigation of the Syracusans and Corinthians, who wished for an invasion to arrest the reinforcements which they had heard that Athens was about to send to Sicily. Alcibiades also urgently advised the fortification of Declia, and a vigorous prosecution of the war. But the Lacedaemonians derived most encouragement from the belief that Athens, with two wars on her hands, against themselves and against the Siceliots, would be more easy to subdue, and from the conviction that she had been the first to infringe the truce in their former war. They considered the offense had been more on their own side, both on account of their entrance of the Thebans. In the former war they considered the offense had been more on their own side, both on account of the entrance of the Thebans into Pladia in time of peace, and also of their own refusal to listen to the Athenian offer of arbitration, in spite of the clause in the former treaty that where arbitration should be offered there should be no appeal to arms. For this reason they thought that they deserved their misfortunes, and took to heart seriously the disaster at Pylos, and whatever else had befallen them. But when, besides the ravages from Pylos, which went on without an intermission, the thirty Athenian ships came out from Argos, and wasted part of Epidaurus, Prisse, and other places, when upon every dispute that arose as to the interpretation of any doubtful point in the treaty, their own offers of arbitration were always rejected by the Athenians. The Lacedaemonians, at length, decided that Athens had now committed the very same offense as they had before done, and had become the guilty party, and they began to be full of ardor for the war. They spent this winter in sending round to their alleys for iron, and in getting ready the other implements for building their fort, and meanwhile began raising at home, and also by forced requisition in the rest of Peloponnese, a force to be sent out in the merchantmen to their allies in Sicily. Winter thus ended, and with it the eighteenth year of this war, of which Thucydides is the historian. In the first days of spring following, at an earlier period than usual, the Lacedaemonians and their allies invaded Attica under the command of Aegis, the son of Archidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians. They began by devastating the parts bordering upon the plain, and next proceeded to fortify Declia, dividing the work among the different cities. Declia is about thirteen or fourteen miles from the city of Athens, and the same distance, or not much farther, from Boeotia, and the fort was meant to annoy the plain in the richest parts of the country, being in sight of Athens. While the Peloponnesians and their allies at Attica were engaged in the work of fortification, their countrymen at home sent off at about the same time the heavy infantry and the merchant vessels to Sicily, the Lacedaemonians furnishing a picked force of helots and neodemodes, or freedmen. Six hundred heavy infantry in all, under the command of Ecritus, a Spartan, and the Boeotians, three hundred heavy cavalry commanded by two Thebans, Xenon and Nikon, and by Hecasander, a Thespian. These were among the first to put out into the open sea, starting from Tenaris and Laconia. Not long after the departure, the Corinthians sent off a force of five hundred heavy infantry, consisting partly of men from Corinth itself, and partly of Arcadian mercenaries, placed under the command of Alex Archis, a Corinthian. The Sisonians also sent off two hundred heavy infantry at the same time as the Corinthians, under the command of Sargius, a Sisonian. Meantime, the five-and-twenty vessels manned by Corinth during the winter lay confronting the twenty Athenian ships at Naupactus, until the heavy infantry at the merchantmen were fairly on their way from Peloponnese, thus fulfilling the object for which they had been manned originally which was to divert the attention of the Athenians from the merchantmen to the galleys. 
During this time the Athenians were not idle. Simultaneously with the fortification of Decleia, at the very beginning of spring they sent thirty ships round Peloponnese under Charicles, son of Apollodorus, with instruction to call at Argos and demand a force of their heavy infantry for the fleet, agreeably to the alliance. At the same time, they dispatched Demosthenes to Sicily, as they had intended, with sixty Athenian and five Shean vessels, twelve hundred Athenian heavy infantry from the muster roll, and as many of the islanders as could be raised in the different corners, drawing upon the other subject allies for whatever they could supply that would be of use for the war. Demosthenes was instructed first to sail around with Charicles, and to operate with him upon the coast of Laconia, and accordingly sailed to Aegina, and there waited for the remainder of his armament, and for Charicles to fetch the Argive troops. In Sicily, about the same time in this spring, Gallippus came to Syracuse with as many troops as he could bring from the cities which he had persuaded to join. Calling the Syracusians together, he told them that they must man as many ships as possible, and try their hand at sea-fight, by which he hoped to achieve an advantage in the war not unworthy of the risk. With him Hermocrates actively joined, in trying to encourage his countrymen to attack the Athenians at sea, saying that the latter had not inherited their naval prowess, nor would they retain it for ever. They had been landsmen even to greater degree than the Syracusans, and had only become a maritime power when obliged by the Medi. Besides, the daring spirits like the Athenians, a daring adversary would seem the most formidable, and the Athenian plan of paralyzing by the boldness of their attack and neighbor, often not their inferior in strength, could now be used against them with as good effect by the Syracusans. He was convinced also that the unlooked-for spectacle of Syracusans daring to face the Athenian navy would cause a terror to the enemy, the advantages of which would far outweigh any loss that the Athenian science might inflict upon their inexperience. He accordingly urged them to throw aside their fears and to try their fortune at sea, and the Syracusans, under the influence of Gallippus at Hermocrates, and perhaps some others, made up their minds for the sea fight and began to man their vessels. When the fleet was ready, Gallippus led out the whole army by night, his plan being to assault in person the forts on Plemirium by land, while thirty-five Syracusan galleys sailed according to appointment against the enemy from the great harbor, and the forty-five remaining came round from the lesser harbor where they had their arsenal. In order to effect a junction with those inside and simultaneously to attack Plemirium, and thus to distract the Athenians by assaulting them on two sides at once, the Athenians quickly manned sixty ships, and with twenty-five of these engaged the thirty-five of the Syracusans in the great harbour, sending the rest to meet those sailing round from the arsenal, and an action now ensued directly in front of the mouth of the great harbour, maintained with equal tenacity on both sides, the one wishing to force the passage, the other to prevent it. In the meantime, while the Athenians in Plemirium were down at the sea, attending to the engagement, Gallippus made a sudden attack on the forts in the early morning, and took the largest first, and afterwards the two smaller, whose garrisons did not wait for him, seeing the largest so easily taken. At the fall of the first fort, the men from it who succeeded in taking refuge in their boats and merchantmen found great difficulty in reaching the camp, as the Syracusans were having the best of it in the engagement in the great harbour, and sent a fast-sailing galley to pursue them. But when two others fell, the Syracusans were now being defeated, and the fugitives from these sailed along shore with more ease. The Syracusan ships, fighting off the mouth of the harbour, forced their way through the Athenian vessels, and sailing in without any order fell foul of one another, and transferred the victory to the Athenians, who not only routed the squadron in question, but also that by which they were at first being defeated in the harbour, sinking eleven of the Syracusan vessels and killing most of the men, except the crews of three ships whom they made prisoners. Their own loss was confined to three vessels, and after hauling ashore the Syracusan wrecks and setting up a trophy upon the islet in front of Plemirium, they retired to their own camp. Unsuccessful at sea, the Syracusans had nevertheless the forts in Plemirium, for which they set up three trophies. One of the two last taken they raised, but put in order and garrisoned the two others. 
In the capture of the forts a great many men were killed and made prisoners, and a great quantity of property was taken in all. As the Athenians had used them as a magazine, there was a large stock of goods and corn of the merchants inside, and also a large stock belonging to the captains, the masts and the other furniture of forty galleys being taken, besides three galleys which had been drawn up on shore. Indeed, the first and chiefest cause of the ruin of the Athenian army was the capture of Pomerium, even the entrance of the harbour being now no longer safe for carrying in provisions, as the Syracusan vessels were stationed there to prevent it, and nothing could be brought in without fighting. Besides the general impression of dismay and discouragement produced upon the army. After this, the Syracusans sent out twelve ships under the command of Agatharchus, a Syracusan. One of these went to Peloponnese with ambassador to describe the hopeful state of their affairs, and to incite the Peloponnesians to prosecute the war there even more actively than they were doing now, while the eleven others sailed to Italy, hearing that vessels laden with stores were on their way to Athenians. After falling in with and destroying most of the vessels in question, and burning in the Colonian territory a quantity of timber for shipbuilding which had been got ready for the Athenians, the Syracusan squad went to Locri, and one of the merchantmen from Peloponnese coming in while they were at anchor there, carrying thespian heavy infantry, took these on board and sailed along shore towards home. The Athenians were on the lookout for them with twenty ships at Megara but were only able to take one vessel with its crew, the rest getting clear off to Syracuse. There was also some skirmishing in the harbor about the piles which the Syracusans had driven in the sea in front of the old docks to allow their ships to lie at anchor inside without being hurt by Athenians sailing up and running them down. The Athenians brought up to them a ship of ten thousand talents burden furnished with wooden turrets and screens, and fastened ropes round the piles from their boats, wrenched them up and broke them, or dived down and sawed them in two. Meanwhile the Syracusans plied them with missiles from the docks, to which they replied from their large vessel, until at last most of the piles were moved by the Athenians, but the most awkward part of the stockade was the part out of sight. Some of the piles which had been driven in did not appear above water, so that it was dangerous to sail up for fear of running the ships upon them just as upon a reef, though not seeing them. However, divers went down and sawed off even these for reward, although the Syracusans drove in others. Indeed, there was no end to the contrivances to which they resorted against each other, as might be expected between two hostile armies confronting each other at such a short distance, and skirmishes and all kinds of other attempts were of constant occurrence. Meanwhile, the Syracusans sent embassies to the cities composed of Corinthians, Ambrosiats, and Lacedaemonians, to tell of the capture of Plemirium and that their defeat in the sea fight was due less to the strength of the enemy than to their own disorder, and generally to let them know that they were full of hope and to desire them to come to their help with ships and troops, as the Athenians were expected with a fresh army, and if the one already there could be destroyed before the other arrived, the war would be at an end. While the contending parties in Sicily were thus engaged, Demosthenes, having now gotten together the armament with which he was to go to the island, put out from Aegina, and making sail from Peloponnese, joined Charicles and the thirty ships of the Athenians. Taking on board the heavy infantry from Argos, they sailed to Laconia, and, after first plundering part of Epidaurus Limera, landed on the coast of Laconia, opposite Cythera, where the temple of Apollo stands and, laying part of the country, fortified a sort of isthmus in, to which the helots of Lacedaemonians might desert, and from whence plundering incursions might be made as from Pylos. Demosthenes helped to occupy this place, and then immediately sailed on to Cochira to take up some of the allies in that island, and so to proceed without delay to Sicily, while Charicles waited until he had completed the fortification of the place, and leaving a garrison there, returned home subsequently with his thirty ships and the Argives also. This same summer arrived at Athens thirteen hundred targeteers, Thracian swordsmen of the tribe of the D, who were to have sailed to Sicily with Demosthenes. Since they had come too late, the Athenians determined to send them back to Thrace, whence they had come, to keep them for the Decelian war appearing 
too expensive, as the pay of each man was a drachma a day. Indeed, since Declia had been first fortified by the whole Peloponnesian army during the summer, and then occupied for the annoyance of the country by the garrisons from the cities relieving each other at stated intervals, it had been doing great mischief to the Athenians. In fact, this occupation by the destruction of property and loss of men which resulted from it was one of the principal causes of their ruin. Previously the invasions were short, and did not prevent their enjoying their land during the rest of the time. The enemy was now permanently fixed in Attica. At one time it was an attack in force, at another it was a regular garrison, overrunning the country and making forays into it for its subsistence. And the Lacedaemonian king, Aegis, was in the field and diligently prosecuting the war. Great mischief was therefore done to the Athenians. They were deprived of their whole country, more than twenty thousand slaves had deserted, a great part of them artisans, and all of their sheep and beasts of burden were lost, and as the cavalry rode out daily upon excursions to Declia and to guard the country, their horses were either lamed by being constantly worked upon rocky ground or wounded by the enemy. Besides the transport of provisions from Euboa, which had before been carried on so much more quickly overhand by Declia from Oropos, was now effected at great cost by sea around Sunium. Everything the city required had to be imported from abroad, and instead of a city it became a fortress. Summer and winter the Athenians were worn out by having to keep guard on the fortifications during the day, by turns, by nights altogether. The cavalry accepted at the different military posts or upon the wall. But what most oppressed them was that they had two wars at once, and they had thus reached a pitch of frenzy which no one would have believed possible if he had heard of it before it had come to pass. For could any one have imagined that even when besieged by the Peloponnesians entrenched in Attica they would still, instead of withdrawing from Sicily, stay on there besieging in like manner Syracuse, a town taken as a town, in no way inferior to Athens, or would so thoroughly upset the Hellenic estimate of their strength and audacity, as to give the spectacle of a people which at the beginning of the war some thought might hold out one year, some two, none more than three, if the Peloponnesians invaded their country. Now seventeen years after the first invasion, after having already suffered from all the evils of war, going to Sicily and undertaking a new war nothing inferior to that which they already had with the Peloponnesians. These causes, the great losses from Declia, and the other heavy charges that fell upon them, produced their financial embarrassment. And it was at this time that they imposed upon their subjects, instead of a tribute, the tax of a twentieth upon all imports and exports by sea, which they thought would bring them in more money, their expenditure being now not the same as at first, but having grown with the war while their revenues decayed. Accordingly, not wishing to incur expense in their present want of money, they sent back at once the Thracians who came too late for Demosthenes, under the conduct of Diotrephes, who was instructed, as they were to pass through Euripus, to make use of them, if possible, in the voyage along shore to injure the enemy. Diotrephes first landed them at Tanagra, and hastily snatched some booty. He then sailed across the Euripus, in the event from Chalcis in Euboa, and disembarking in Boeotia, led them against Mycolysis. The night he passed unobserved near the temple of Hermes, not quite two miles from Mycolysis, and at daybreak assaulted and took the town, which is not a large one. The inhabitants being off their guard, and not expecting that any one would ever come up so far from the sea to molest them, the wall being too weak, and in some places having tumbled down, while in others it had not been built to any height, and the gates also being left open through their feeling of security, the Thracians bursting into Mycolysis, sacked their houses and temples, and butchered the inhabitants, sparing neither their youth nor age, but killing all they fell in with, one after the other, children and women, and even beasts of burden, and whatever other living creature they saw. The Thracian race, like the bloodiest of the barbarians, being even more so when it had nothing to fear. Everywhere confusion reigned, and death in all its shapes, and in particular they attacked a boys' school, the largest that there was in the place, into which the children had just gone and massacred them all. In short, the disaster falling upon the whole town was unsurpassed in magnitude, and unapproached by any in suddenness and in horror. Meanwhile the Thebans heard of it, and marched to the rescue, and overtaking the Thracians before they got far, recovered the plunder, and drove them into the Euripus and the sea, 
where the vessels which brought them were lying. The greatest slaughter took place while they were embarking, as they did not know how to swim, and those in the vessels, on seeing what was going on on shore, moored them out of the bowshot and the rest of the retreat, the Thurisians made a very respectable defence against the Theban horse, by which they were first attacked, dashing out and closing their ranks according to the tactics of the country, and lost only a few men in the part of the fair. A good number who were after plunder were actually caught in the town and put to death. Altogether the Thracians had two hundred and fifty killed out of thirteen hundred, the Thebans and the rest who came to rescue about twenty, troopers and heavy infantry with Scyrophondus, one of the Boatarchs. The Michaelesians lost a large proportion of their population. While Michaelesus thus experienced a calamity for existent as lamentable as any that happened in the war, Demosthenes, who we left sailing to Corcyra, after the building of the fort in Laconia, found a merchantman laying in Phia in Elis, in which the Corinthian heavy infantry were to cross to Sicily. The ship he destroyed, but the men escaped, and subsequently got another in, which they pursued their voyage. After this, arriving at Zacynthus and Cephalenia, he took a body of heavy infantry on board, and sending for some of the Messenians from Naupactus, crossed over to the opposite shore of Achaemenia, to Alzea, and to the Acatorium, which was held, in the, held by the Athenians. While he was in these parts, he was met by Eurymedon, returning from Sicily, where he had been sent, as they had been mentioned, during the winter, with the money for the army, who told him the news, and also that he had heard while at sea that the Syracusans had taken Plemirium. Here also Conon came to them, the commander at Nopactus, with news that the twenty-five Corinthian ships stationed opposite to him, far from giving over the war, were meditating an engagement, and he therefore begged them to send some ships, as his own eighteen were not a match for the enemy's twenty-five. Demosthenes and Eurymedon, accordingly, sent ten of their best sailors, with Conon to reinforce the squadrons in Naupactus, and meanwhile prepared for the muster of their forces. Eurymedon, who was now the colleague of Demosthenes, and had turned back in consequence of his appointment, sailing to Corcyra to send them to man fifteen ships and to enlist heavy infantry, while Demosthenes raised slingers and darters from the parts about Achaemenia. Meanwhile, the envoys already mentioned, who had gone from Syracuse to the cities after the capture of Plumerium, had succeeded in their mission, and were about to bring the armies that they had collected, when Nicias got scent of it, and sent to the Centorope and Alysians and other of the friendly Sicils, who held the passes, not to let the enemy through, but to combine to prevent their passing, there being no other way by which they could even attempt it, as the Agrigentines would not give them a passage through their country. Agreeably to this request, the Sicil laid a triple ambuscade for the Siceliots upon their march, and attacking them suddenly, while off their guard, killed about eight hundred of them, all of the envoys, the Corinthians only excepted, by whom fifteen hundred who escaped were conducted to Syracuse. About the same time the Camerinians also came to the assistance of Syracuse, with five hundred heavy infantry, three hundred darters, and as many archers, while the Geloans sent crews for five ships, four hundred darters, and two hundred horse. Indeed, almost the whole of Sicily, except the Agrigentines, who were neutral, now ceased merely to watch events as it had hitherto done, and actively joined Syracuse against the Athenians. While the Syracusans, after the Sicil disaster, put off any immediate attack upon the Athenians, Demosthenes and Eurymedon, whose forces from Corcyra had, and the continent were now ready, crossed the Ionian Gulf with all of their armament to the Ipygian promontory, and starting from thence, touched at the Choerades Isles, lying off Ipagia where they took on board a hundred and fifty Ipygian darters of the Mississippian tribe, and after renewing an old friendship with Artis, the chief, who had furnished them with the darters, arrived at Metapontium in Italy. Here they persuaded their allies, the Metapontines, to send with them three hundred darters and two galleys, and with this reinforcement coasted on to Thurii, where they found the party hostile to Athens recently expelled by a revolution and accordingly remained there to muster and review the whole army, to see if any had been left behind, and to prevail upon the Thurians resolutely to join them in their expedition, and in the circumstances in which they found themselves, to conclude a defensive and offensive alliance with the Athenians. 
About the same time, the Peloponnesians, in twenty-five ships stationed opposite to the squadron of Napoctus to protect the passage of the transport to Sicily, had got ready for engaging and manning some additional vessels, so as to be numerically little inferior to the Athenians anchored off Uranius in Achaea in the Rypic country. The place off which they lay being in the form of a crescent, the land forces furnished by the Corinthians and their allies on the spot, came up and ranged themselves upon the projecting headlands on either side, while the fleet, under the command of Polyanthes, a Corinthian, held the intervening space and blocked up the entrance. The Athenians under Dephilus now sailed out against them, with thirty-three ships from Nalpactus and the Corinthians, at first not moving, at length, though, they saw their opportunity, raised the signal, and advanced and engaged the Athenians. After an obstinate struggle, the Corinthians lost three ships, and without sinking any altogether, disabled seven of the enemy, which were struck prow to prow, and had their four ships strove in by the Corinthian vessels, whose cheeks had been strengthened for this very purpose. After an action of this even character, in which either party could claim the victory, although the Athenians became masters of the wrecks through the wind, driving them out to sea, the Corinthians not putting out again to meet them, the two combatants parted. No pursuit took place, and no prisoners were made on either side. The Corinthians and Peloponnesians, who were fighting near the shore, escaping with ease, and none of the Athenian vessels having been sunk. The Athenians now sailed back to Napoctus, and the Corinthians immediately set up a trophy as victors, because they had disabled a greater number of the enemy's ships. Moreover, they held that they had not been worsted, for the very same reason that their opponent held that he had not been victorious. The Corinthians considered that they were conquerors, if not decidedly conquered, and the Athenians thinking themselves vanquished, because not decidedly victorious. However, when the Peloponnesians sailed off and their land forces had dispersed, the Athenians also set up a trophy as victors in Achaea, about two miles and a quarter from Arrhenius, the Corinthian station. This was the termination of the action in Apoctus. To return to Demosthenes and Eurymedon, the Thurians, having now gotten ready to join in the expedition with seven hundred heavy infantry and three hundred darters, the two generals ordered the ships to sail along the coast of the Crotonian territory, and meanwhile held a review of all the land forces upon the Sybaris, and then led them through the Thurian country. Arrived at the river Hylius, they here received a message from the Crotonians saying that they would not allow the army to pass through their country, upon which the Athenians descended toward the shore, and bivouacked near the sea and the mouth of the Hylius, where the fleet also met them, and the next day embarked and sailed along the coast, touching at all cities except Locri, until they came to Petra in the Regian territory. Meanwhile, the Syracusans, hearing of their approach, resolved to make a second attempt with their fleet and their other forces on the shore which they had been collecting for this very purpose in order to do something before their arrival. In addition to other improvements suggested by the former sea fight which they now adopted in their equipment of their navy, they cut down their prows to a smaller compass to make them more solid and make their cheeks stouter, and from these let stays into the vessel's sides for a length of six cubits within and without, in the same way as the Corinthians had altered their prows before engaging the squadron in Naupactus. The Syracusans thought that they would thus have an advantage over the Athenian vessels, which were not constructed with equal strength, but were slight in the bows, from their being more used to sail round and charge the enemy's side, than to meet him prow to prow, and that the battle being in a great harbour, with a great many ships in not much room, was also a fact in their favour. Charging prow to prow, they would stave in the enemy's bows by striking with solid and stout beaks against hollow and weak ones, and secondly, the Athenians, for want of room, would be unable to use their favorite maneuver of breaking the line or of sailing around, as the Syracusans would do their best not to let them do the one, and want of room would prevent their doing the other. This charging prow to prow, which had hitherto been thought want of skill in a helmsman, would be the Syracusans' chief maneuver, as being that which they should find most useful, since the Athenians, if repulsed, would not be able to back water in any direction except towards the shore, and that only for a little way, and in the little space in front of their own camp. The rest of the harbour would be commanded by the Syracusans, and the Athenians, if hard-pressed, by crowding together in a small space, and all to the same point, would run foul of one another and fall into the disorder, which was, in fact, the thing that did the Mithenians most harm in all the sea-fights, they not having, like the Syracusans, the whole harbour to retreat over. 
As to their sailing round into the open sea, this would be impossible, with the Syracusans in possession of the way out and in, especially as Plumerium would be hostile to them and the mouth of the harbour was not large. With these contrivances to suit their skill and ability, and now more confident in the previous sea fight, the Syracusans attacked by land and sea at once. The town force Gallipus led out a little the first and brought them up to the wall of the Athenians, where it looked toward the city, while the force from the Olympium, that is to say the heavy infantry that were there with the horse and the light troops of the Syracusans, advanced against the wall from the opposite side, the ships of the Syracusans and the allies sailing out immediately afterwards. The Athenians at first fancied that they were to be attacked by land only, and it was not without alarm that they saw the fleet suddenly approaching as well, and while some were forming upon the walls and in front of them against the advancing enemy, and some marching out in haste against the numbers of horse and darters coming from the Olympium, and from outside, others manned the ships or rushed down to the beach to oppose the enemy, and when the ships were manned, put out with seventy-five sail against about eighty of the Syracusans. After spending a great part of the day in advancing and retreating and skirmishing with each other, without either being able to gain any advantage worth speaking of, except that the Syracusans sank one or two of the Athenian vessels, they parted, the land force at the same time retiring from the lines, the next day the Syracusans remained quiet and gave no sign of what they were going to do, but Nicias, seeing that the battle had been a drawn one and expecting that they would attack again, compelled the captains to refit any of the ships that had suffered, and moored merchant vessels before the stockade which had driven into the sea in front of their ships, to serve instead of enclosed harbour at about two hundred feet from each other, in order that any ship that was hard-pressed might be able to retreat in safety and sail out again at leisure. These preparations occupied the Athenians all day until nightfall. The next day the Syracusans began operations at an earlier hour, but with the same plan of attack by land and sea. The great part of the day the rivals spent, as before, confronting and skirmishing with each other, until at last Ariston, son of Pyrrhicus, a Corinthian, the ablest helmsman of the Syracusan service, persuaded their naval commanders to send to the officials in the city and tell them to move the sail market as quickly as they could down to the sea, and oblige everyone to bring whatever eatables that he had and sell them there, thus enabling the commanders to land the crew and dine at once close to the ships, and shortly afterward the selfsame day to attack the Athenians again when they were not expecting it. In compliance with this advice, a messenger was sent, and the market got ready, upon which the Syracusans suddenly backed water and withdrew to the town, and at once landed and took their dinner upon the spot, while the Athenians, supposing they had returned to the town, because they felt they were beaten, disembarked at their leisure and set about getting their dinners and about their other occupations, under the idea that they had done with fighting for that day. Suddenly the Syracusans had manned their ships and again sailed against them, and the Athenians, in great confusion, and most of them fasting, got on board and with great difficulty put out to meet them. For some time both parties remained on the defensive without engaging, until the Athenians at last resolved not to let themselves be worn out by waiting where they were, but to attack without delay, and giving a cheer went into action. The Syracusans received them, and charging prow to prow as they had intended, stove in a great part of the Athenians' foreships by the strength of their beaks. The darters on the decks also did great damage to the Athenians, but still greater damage was done by the Syracusans, who went about in small boats, ran in upon the oars of the Athenian galleys, and sailed against their sides, and discharged from thence their darts upon the sailors. At last, fighting in this action, the Syracusans gained the victory, and the Athenians turned and fled between the merchantmen to their own station. The Syracusan ships pursued them as far as the merchantmen, where they were stopped by the beams armed with dolphins suspended from those vessels over the passage. Two of the Syracusan vessels went too near in the excitement of victory, and were destroyed, one of them being taken with the crew. After sinking seventy of the Athenian vessels, and disabling many, and taking most of the men prisoner and killing others, the Syracusans retired and set up trophies for both the engagements, being now confident in having a decided superiority by sea, and by no means despairing of equal success by land. End of Book 7, Chapter 21「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.'
Recording by Deborah Clark, Winnipeg, Canada. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. Translated by Richard Crawley. Book 7, Chapter 22. Nineteenth Year of the War. Arrival of Demosthenes. Defeat of the Athenians at Epipolae. Folly and Obstinacy of Nicias. In the meantime, while the Syracusans were preparing for a second attack upon both elements, Demosthenes and Eurymedon arrived with the succors from Athens, consisting of about seventy-three ships, including the foreigners, nearly five thousand heavy infantry, Athenian and allied, a large number of darters, Hellenic and barbarian, and slingers and archers, and everything else upon a corresponding scale. The Syracusans and their allies were for the moment not a little dismayed at the idea that there was to be no term or ending to their dangers, seeing, in spite of the fortification of Declia, a new army arrived nearly equal to the former, and the powers of Athens proving so great in every quarter. On the other hand, the first Athenian armament regained a certain confidence in the midst of its misfortunes. Demosthenes, seeing how matters stood, felt that he could not drag on and fare as Nicias had done, who, by wintering in Catana, instead of at once attacking Syracuse, had allowed the terror of his first arrival to evaporate in contempt, and had given time to Gallippus to arrive with a force from Peloponnese, which the Syracusans would never have sent for if he had attacked immediately, for they fancied that they were a match for him by themselves, and would not have discovered their inferiority until they were already invested. And even if they then sent for succors, they would no longer have been equally able to profit by their arrival. Recollecting this, and well aware that it was now on the first day after his arrival that he, like Nicias, was most formidable to the enemy, Demosthenes determined to lose no time in drawing the utmost profit from the consternation at the moment inspired by his army. And seeing that the counterwall of the Syracusans, which hindered the Athenians from investing them, was a single one, and that he, who should become master of the way up to Epipoli, and afterwards of the camp there, would find no difficulty in taking it, as no one would even wait for his attack, made all haste to attempt the enterprise. This he took to be the shortest way of ending the war, as he would either succeed and take Syracuse, or would lead back the armament instead of frittering away the lives of the Athenians engaged in the expedition and the resources of the country at large. First, therefore, the Athenians went out and laid waste the lands of the Syracusans about the Anipus, and carried all before them, as at first by land and by sea, the Syracusans not offering to oppose them upon either element, unless it were with their cavalry and darters from the Olympium. Next, Demosthenes resolved to attempt the counterwall first by means of engines. As, however, the engines that he brought up were burnt by the enemy fighting from the wall, and the rest of the forces repulsed after attacking at many different points, he determined to delay no longer, and, having obtained the consent of Nicias and his fellow commanders, proceeded to put in execution his plan of attacking Epipolae. As by day it seemed impossible to approach and get up without being observed, he ordered provisions for five days, took all the masons and carpenters and other things such as arrows and everything else they could want for the work of fortification if successful, and after the first watch set out with Eurymedon and Menander and the whole army for Epipolae, Nicias being left behind in the lines. Having come up by the hill of Euryalus, where the former army had ascended at first, unobserved by the enemy's guards, they went up to the fort which the Syracusans had there and took it, and put to the sword part of the garrison. The greater number, however, escaped at once and gave the alarm to the camps, of which there were three upon Epipolae defended by outworks, one of the Syracusans, one of the other Siciliots, and one of the allies, and also to the six hundred Syracusans forming the original garrison for this part of Epipolae. These at once advanced against the assailants, and, falling in with Demosthenes and the Athenians, were routed by them after a sharp resistance, the victors immediately pushing on, eager to achieve the objects of the attack, and without giving time for their ardor to cool. Meanwhile, others from the very beginning were taking the counterwall of the Syracusans, which was abandoned by its garrison, and pulling down the battlements. The Syracusans and the allies, and Gallippus, with the troops under his command, advanced to the rescue from the outworks, but engaged in some consternation, a night attack being a piece of audacity which they had never expected, and were at first compelled to retreat. But while the Athenians, 
flushed with their victory, now advanced with less order, wishing to make their way as quickly as possible through the whole force of the enemy not yet engaged, without relaxing their attack or giving them time to rally, the Boeotians made the first stand against them, attacked them, routed them, and put them to flight. The Athenians now fell into great disorder and perplexity, so that it was not easy to get from one side or the other any detailed account of the affair. By day, certainly the combatants had a clearer notion, though even then by no means of all that takes place, no one knowing much of anything that does not go on in his own immediate neighborhood. But in a night engagement, and this was the only one that occurred between great armies during the war, how could any one know anything for certain? Although there was a bright moon, they saw each other only as men do by moonlight. That is to say, they could distinguish the form of the body, but could not tell for certain whether it was a friend or an enemy. Both had great numbers of heavy infantry moving about in a small space. Some of the Athenians were already defeated, while others were coming up yet unconquered for their first attack. A large part of the rest of their forces either had only just got up or were still ascending, so that they did not know which way to march. Owing to the rout that had taken place, all in front was now in confusion, and the noise made it difficult to distinguish anything. The victorious Syracusans and allies were cheering each other on with loud cries, by night the only possible means of communication, and meanwhile receiving all who came against them, while the Athenians were seeking from one another, taking all in front of them for enemies, even though they might be some of their own, now flying friends, and by constantly asking for the watchword, which was their only means of recognition, not only caused great confusion among themselves by asking all at once, but also made it known to the enemy, whose own they did not so readily discover as the Syracusans were victorious and not scattered, and thus less easily mistaken. The result was that if the Athenians fell in with a party of the enemy that was weaker than they, it is escaped them through knowing their watchword, while if they themselves failed to answer, they were put to the sword. But what hurt them as much, or indeed more than anything else, was the singing of the paean from the perplexity which it caused by being nearly the same on either side. The Argives and the Corsinians, and any other Dorian peoples in the army, struck terror into the Athenians whenever they raised their paean, no less than did the enemy. Thus, after being once thrown into disorder, they ended by coming into collision with each other in many parts of the field, friends with friends and citizens with citizens, and not only terrified one another, but even came to blows and could only be parted with difficulty. In the pursuit many perished by throwing themselves down the cliffs, the way down from Epipole being narrow, and those who got down safely into the plain, although many, especially those who belonged to the first army, escaped through their better acquaintance of the locality. Some of the newcomers lost their way and wandered over the country, and were cut off in the morning by the Syracusan cavalry and killed. The next day the Syracusans set up two trophies, one upon Epipole where the ascent had been made, and the other on the spot where the first check was given by the Boeotians, and the Athenians took back their dead under truce. A great many of the Athenians and allies were killed, although still more arms were taken than could be accounted for by the number of dead, and as some of those who were obliged to leap down from the cliffs without their shields escaped with their lives and did not perish like the rest. After this the Syracusans, recovering their old confidence at such an unexpected stroke of good fortune, dispatched Sicanus with fifteen ships to the Aggregentum, where there was a revolution, to induce, if possible, the city to join them. Well, Gallippus, again went by land into the rest of Sicily to bring up reinforcements, being now in hope of taking the Athenian lines by storm after the result of the affair on Epipole. In the meantime the Athenian generals consulted upon the disaster which had happened, and upon the general weakness of the army. They saw themselves unsuccessful in their enterprises, and the soldiers disgusted with their stay, disease being rife among them owing to it being the sickly season of the year, and to the marshy and unhealthy nature of the spot in which they were encamped, and the state of their affairs generally being thought desperate. Accordingly, Demosthenes was of the opinion they ought not to stay any longer, but agreeably to his original idea in risking the attempt upon Epipole, now that this had failed, he gave his vote for going away without further loss of time, while the sea might yet be crossed, and their late reinforcement might give them the superiority at all events on that element. He also said that it would be more profitable for the state to carry on the war against those who were building fortification in Attica than against the Syracusans, whom it was no longer easy to subdue, besides which it was not right to squander large sums of money to no purpose by going on with the siege. 
This was the opinion of Demosthenes. Nicias, without denying the bad state of their affairs, was unwilling to avow their weakness, or to have it reported to the enemy that the Athenians in full council were openly voting for retreat, for in that case they would be much less likely to effect it when they wanted without discovery. Moreover, his own particular information still gave him reason to hope that the affairs of the enemy would soon be in a worse state than their own, if the Athenians persevered in the siege, as they would wear out the Syracusans by want of money, especially with the more extensive command of the sea now given them by their present navy. Besides this, there was a party in Syracuse who wished to betray the city to the Athenians, and kept sending him messages and telling him not to raise the siege. According knowing this and really waiting because he hesitated between the two courses and wished to see his way more clearly in his public speech on this occasion he refused to lead off the army saying he was sure the athenians would never approve of their returning without a vote of theirs those who would vote upon their conduct instead of judging the facts as eye-witnesses like themselves and not from what they might hear from hostile critics would simply be guided by the calumnies of the first clever speaker while many indeed most of the soldiers on the spot who now so loudly proclaimed the danger of their position when they reached athens would proclaim just as loudly the opposite and would say that their generals had been bribed to betray them and return for himself therefore who knew the athenian temper sooner than perish under a dishonorable charge and by an unjust sentence at the hands of the athenians he would rather take his chance and die if die he must a soldier's death at the hands of the enemy. Besides, after all, the Syracusans were in a worse case than themselves. What with paying mercenaries, spending upon fortified posts, and now, for a full year maintaining a large navy, they were already at a loss, and would soon be at a standstill. They had already spent two thousand talents, and incurred heavy debts besides, and could not lose even ever so small a fraction of their present force through not paying it, without ruin to their cause depending as they did more upon mercenaries than upon soldiers obliged to serve like their own he therefore said they ought to stay and carry on the siege and not depart defeated in point of money in which they were much superior Nicias spoke positively because he had exact information of the financial distress at Syracuse, and also because of the strength of the Athenian party there, which kept sending him messages not to raise the siege, besides which he had more confidence than before in his fleet, and felt sure at least of its success. Demosthenes, however, would not hear for a moment of continuing the siege, but said that if they could not lead off the army without a decree from Athens, and if they were obliged to stay on, they ought to remove to Thapsus or Catana, where their land forces would have a wide extent of country to overrun, and could live by plundering the enemy, and would thus do them damage, while the fleet would have the open sea to fight in, that is to say, instead of a narrow space which was all in the enemy's favor, a wide sea-room where their science would be of use, and where they could retreat or advance without being confined or circumscribed, either when they put out or put in. In any case he was altogether opposed to their staying on where they were, and insisted on removing at once, as quickly and as with little delay as possible, and in this judgment Eurmedon agreed. Nicias, however, still objecting, a certain diffidence and hesitation came over them, with a suspicion that Nicias might have some further information to make him so positive. End of Book 7 Chapter 22「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. Translated by Richard Crawley. Book 7, Chapter 23. Nineteenth Year of the War. Battles in the Great Harbor. Retreat and Annihilation of the Athenian Army While the Athenians lingered on in this way, without moving from where they were, Gelippus and Sicanus now arrived at Syracuse. Sicanus had failed to gain Agrigentum, the party friendly to the Syracusans having been driven out while he was still at Gala. But Gelippus was accompanied not only by a large number of troops raised in Sicily, but by the heavy infantry sent off in the spring from Peloponnese in the merchantmen, who had arrived at Selinus from Libya, 
they had been carried to Libya by a storm, and having obtained two galleys and pirates from the Cyrenians, on their voyage along shore had taken sides with the U.S. Perite, and had defeated the Libyans who were besieging them, and from thence coasting on to Neapolis, a Carthaginian mart, and the nearest point to Sicily, from which it is only two days and a night's voyage, there crossed over and came to Salinas. Immediately upon their arrival, the Syracusans prepared to attack the Athenians again by land and sea at once. The Athenian generals, seeing a fresh army come to the aid of the enemy, and that their own circumstances, far from improving, were becoming daily worse, and above all distressed by the sickness of the soldiers, now began to repent of not having removed before, and Nicias no longer offering the same opposition, except by urging that there should be no open voting, they gave orders as secretly as possible for all to be prepared to sail out from the camp at a given signal. All was at last ready and they were on the point of sailing away, when an eclipse of the moon, which was then at the full, took place. Most of the Athenians, deeply impressed by this occurrence, now urged the generals to wait, and Nicias, who was somewhat over-addicted to divination and practices of that kind, refused from that moment even to take the question of departure into consideration, until they had waited the thrice nine days prescribed by the soothsayers. The besiegers were thus condemned to stay in the country, and the Syracusans, getting wind of what had happened, became more eager than ever to press the Athenians, who had now themselves acknowledged that they were no longer their superiors either by sea or by land, as otherwise they would never have planned to sail away. Besides which, the Syracusans did not wish them to settle in any other part of Sicily, where they would be more difficult to deal with, but desired to force them to fight at sea as quickly as possible, in a position favourable to themselves. Accordingly they manned their ships, and practised for as many days as they thought sufficient. When the moment arrived, they assaulted on the first day the Athenian lines, and upon a small force of heavy infantry and horse sallying out against them by certain gates, cut off some of the former, and routed and pursued them to the lines, where, as the entrance was narrow, the Athenians lost seventy horses, and some few of the heavy infantry. Drawing off their troops for this day, on the next the Syracusans went out with a fleet of seventy-six sail, and at the same time advanced with their land forces against the lines. The Athenians put out to meet them with eighty-six ships, came to close quarters, and engaged. The Syracusans and their allies first defeated the Athenian centre, and then caught Eurymedon, the commander of the right wing, who was sailing out from the line more towards the land in order to surround the enemy, in the hollow and recess of the harbour and killed him, and destroyed the ships accompanying him, after which they now chased the whole Athenian fleet before them, and drove them ashore. Gylippus, seeing the enemy's fleet defeated and carried ashore beyond their stockades and camp, ran down to the breakwater with some of his troops, in order to cut off the men as they landed, and make it easier for the Syracusans to tow off the vessels by the shore being friendly ground. The Tyrrhenians who guarded this point for the Athenians, seeing them come on in disorder, advanced out against them, and attacked and routed their van, hurling it into the marsh of Lysimelea. Afterwards the Syracusan and allied troops arrived in greater numbers, and the Athenians, fearing for their ships, came up also to the rescue, and engaged them, and defeated and pursued them to some distance, and killed a few of their heavy infantry. They succeeded in rescuing most of their ships, and brought them down by their camp, Eighteen, however, were taken by the Syracusans and their allies, and all the men were killed. The rest the enemy tried to burn by means of an old merchantman, which they filled with faggots and pinewood, set on fire, and let drift down the wind which blew full on the Athenians. The Athenians, however, alarmed for their ships, contrived means for stopping it and putting it out, and checking the flames and the nearer approach of the merchantman, thus escaped the danger. After this, the Syracusans set up a trophy for the sea-fight, and for the heavy infantry whom they had cut off up at the lines, where they took the horses, and the Athenians for the rout of the foot driven by the Tyrrhenians into the marsh, and for their own victory with the rest of the army. The Syracusans had now gained a decisive victory at sea, where until now they had feared the reinforcement brought by Demosthenes, and deep in consequence was the despondency of the Athenians, and great their disappointment, and greater still their regret for having come on the expedition. 
these were the only cities that they had yet encountered, similar to their own in character, under democracies like themselves, which had ships and horses, and were of considerable magnitude. They had been unable to divide and bring them over by holding out the prospect of changes in their governments, or to crush them by their great superiority in force, but had failed in most of their attempts, and being already in perplexity, had now been defeated at sea, where defeat could never have been expected, and were thus plunged deeper in embarrassment than ever. Meanwhile, the Syracusans immediately began to sail freely along the harbour, and determined to close up its mouth, so that the Athenians might not be able to steal out in future, even if they wished. Indeed, the Syracusans no longer thought only of saving themselves, but also how to hinder the escape of the enemy, thinking, and thinking rightly, that they were now much the stronger, and that to conquer the Athenians and their allies by land and sea would win them great glory in Hellas. The rest of the Hellenes would thus immediately be freed or released from apprehension, as the remaining forces of Athens would be henceforth unable to sustain the war that would be waged against her, while they, the Syracusans, would be regarded as the authors of this deliverance, and would be held in high admiration, not only with all men now living, but also with posterity. Nor were these the only considerations that gave dignity to the struggle. They would thus conquer not only the Athenians, but also their numerous allies, and conquer not alone, but with their companions in arms, commanding side by side with the Corinthians and Lacedaemonians, having offered their city to stand in the van of danger, and having been, in a great measure, the pioneers of naval success. Indeed, there were never so many peoples assembled before a single city, if we accept the grand total gathered together in this war under Athens and Lacedaemon. The following were the states on either side who came to Syracuse to fight for or against Sicily, to help to conquer or defend the island. Right or community of blood was not the bond of union between them, so much as interest or compulsion, as the case may be. The Athenians themselves, being Ionians, went against the Dorians of Syracuse of their own free will, and the people still speaking Attic and using the Athenian laws, the Lemnians, Imbrians, and Aegenetans, that is to say, the then occupants of Aegina, being their colonists, went with them. To these must also be added the Hestians, dwelling at Hestia in Euboea. Of the rest some joined in the exposition as subjects of the Athenians, others as independent allies, others as mercenaries. To the number of the subjects paying tribute belonged the Eritreans, Chalcidians, Styrians, and Caristians from Euboea, the Ceans, Andrians, and Tenians from the islands, and the Milesians, Samians, and Chians from Ionia. The Chians, however, joined as independent allies, paying no tribute, but furnishing ships. Most of these were Ionians, and descended from the Athenians, except the Caristians, who were Dryopes, and although subjects and obliged to serve, were still Ionians fighting against Dorians. Besides these there were men of Aeolic race, the Methymnians, subjects who provided ships, not tribute, and the Tenedians and Aenians, who provided tribute. These Aeolians fought against their Aeolian founders, the Boeotians in the Syracusan army, because they were obliged, while the Plataeans, the only native Boeotians opposed to Boeotians, did so upon a just quarrel. Of the Rhodians and Cytherians, both Dorians, the latter, Lacedaemonian colonists, fought in the Athenian ranks against their Lacedaemonian countrymen with Gylippus, while the Rhodians, Argives by race, were compelled to bear arms against the Dorian Syracusans and their own colonists, the Geloans, serving with the Syracusans. Of the islanders round Peloponnese, the Cephalenians and Zacynthians accompanied the Athenians as independent allies, although their insular position really left them little choice in the matter, owing to the maritime supremacy of Athens, while the Corsirians, who were not only Dorians but Corinthians, were openly serving against Corinthians and Syracusans, although colonists of the former and of the same race as the latter, under color of compulsion, but really out of free will through hatred of Corinth. The Messenians, as they are now called in Naupactus and from Pylos, then held by the Athenians, were taken with them to the war. There were also a few Megarian exiles, whose fate it was to be now fighting against the Megarian Selenentines. The engagement of the rest was of a more voluntary nature. It was less the league than hatred of the Lacedaemonians, and the immediate private advantage of each individual that persuaded the Dorian Argives to join the Ionian Athenians in a war against Dorians, 
while the Mantinians and other Arcadian mercenaries, accustomed to go against the enemy pointed out to them at the moment, were led by interest to regard the Arcadians serving with the Corinthians as just as much their enemies as any others. The Cretans and Aetolians also served for hire, and the Cretans, who had joined the Rhodians in founding Gala, thus came to consent to fight for pay against, instead of for, their colonists. There were also some Acarnanians, paid to serve, although they came chiefly for love of Demosthenes, and out of good will to the Athenians, whose allies they were. These all lived on the Hellenic side of the Ionian Gulf. Of the Italiates there were the Thurians and Metapontines, dragged into the quarrel by the stern necessities of a time of revolution, of the Siceliots, the Naxians and the Cataneans, and of the barbarians, the Egestaeans, who called in the Athenians, most of the Sicels, and outside Sicily, some Tyrrhenian enemies of Syracuse and Apigean mercenaries. Such were the peoples serving with the Athenians. Against these, the Syracusans had the Camarinaeans, their neighbors, the Geloans who lived next to them, then passing over the neutral Agrigentines, the Selenuntines settled on the farther side of the island. These inhabit the part of Sicily looking towards Libya, the Himeraeans came from the side toward the Tyrrhenian Sea, being the only Hellenic inhabitants in that quarter, and the only people that came from thence to the aid of the Syracusans. Of the Hellenes in Sicily, the above peoples joined in the war, all Dorians and independent, and of the barbarians the Sicels only, that is to say, such as did not go over to the Athenians. Of the Hellenes outside Sicily there were the Lacedaemonians, who provided a Spartan to take the command, and a force of Neodamides, or freedmen and of Helots, the Corinthians, who alone joined with naval and land forces, with their Leucadian and Ambraciate kinsmen, some mercenaries sent by Corinth from Arcadia, some Sicyonians forced to serve, and from outside Peloponnese, the Boeotians. In comparison, however, with these foreign auxiliaries, the great Sicilian cities furnished more in every department, numbers of heavy infantry, ships and horses, and an immense multitude besides having been brought together, while in comparison, again, one may say, with all the rest put together, provided by the Syracusans themselves, both from the greatness of the city and from the fact that they were in the greatest danger. Such were the auxiliaries brought together on either side, all of which had by this time joined, neither party experiencing any subsequent accession. It was no wonder, therefore, if the Syracusans and their allies thought that it would win them great glory if they could follow up their recent victory in the sea-fight by the capture of the whole Athenian armada, without letting it escape either by sea or by land. They began at once to close up the great harbour by means of boats, merchant vessels, and galleys moored broadside across its mouth, which is nearly a mile wide, and made all their other arrangements for the event of the Athenians again venturing to fight at sea. There was, in fact, nothing little, either in their plans or their ideas. The Athenians, seeing them close up the harbour, and informed of their further designs, called a council of war. The generals and colonels assembled and discussed the difficulties of the situation, the point which pressed most being that they no longer had provisions for immediate use, having sent on to Catana to tell them not to send any, in the belief that they were going away, and that they would not have any in future unless they could command the sea. They therefore determined to evacuate their upper lines, to enclose with a cross-wall, and garrison a small space close to the ships, only just sufficient to hold their stores and sick, and manning all the ships, seaworthy or not, with every man that could be spared from the rest of their land forces, to fight it out at sea, and if victorious, to go to Catana, if not, to burn their vessels, form in close order, and retreat by land for the nearest friendly place they could reach, Hellenic or Barbarian. This was no sooner settled than carried into effect. They descended gradually from the upper lines and manned all their vessels, compelling all to go on board who were of age to be in any way of use. They thus succeeded in manning about one hundred and ten ships in all, on board of which they embarked a number of archers and darters taken from the Archananians and from the other foreigners, marking all other provisions allowed by the nature of their plan and by the necessities which imposed it. All was now nearly ready and Nicias, seeing the soldiery disheartened by their unprecedented and decided defeat at sea, and by reason of the scarcity of provisions eager to fight it out as soon as possible, called them all together, and first addressed them, speaking as follows. Soldiers of the Athenians and of the Allies, we have all an equal interest in the coming struggle, in which life and country are at stake for us quite as much as they can be for the enemy.' 
since if our fleet wins the day, each can see his native city again, wherever that city may be. You must not lose heart, or be like men without any experience, who fail in a first essay and ever afterwards fearfully forebode a future as disastrous. But let the Athenians among you, who have already had experience of many wars, and the allies who have joined us in so many expeditions, remember the surprises of war, and with the hope that fortune will not be always against us, prepare to fight again in a manner worthy of the number which you see yourselves to be. Now, whatever we thought would be of service against the crush of vessels in such a narrow harbour, and against the force upon the decks of the enemy, from which we suffered before, has all been considered with the helmsmen, and as far as our means allowed, provided. A number of archers and darters will go on board, and a multitude that we should not have employed in an action in the open sea, where our science would be crippled by the weight of the vessels, but in the present land-fight that we are forced to make from shipboard, all this will be useful." We have also discovered the changes in construction that we must make to meet theirs. And against the thickness of their cheeks, which did us the greatest mischief, we have provided grappling irons, which will prevent an assailant backing water after charging, if the soldiers on deck here do their duty. Since we are absolutely compelled to fight a land battle from the fleet, and it seems to be our interest neither to back water ourselves, nor to let the enemy do so, especially as the shore, except so much of it as may be held by our troops, is hostile ground. You must remember this, and fight on as long as you can, and must not let yourselves be driven ashore, but once alongside must make up your minds not to part company until you have swept the heavy infantry from the enemy's deck. I say this more for the heavy infantry than for the seamen, as it is more the business of the men on deck, and our land forces are even now on the whole the strongest. The sailors I advise, and at the same time implore, not to be too much daunted by their misfortunes, now that we have our decks better armed and greater number of vessels. Bear in mind how well worth preserving is the pleasure felt by those of you, who through your knowledge of our language and imitation of our manners were always considered Athenians, even though not so in reality, and as such were honoured throughout Hellas, and had your full share of the advantages of our empire, and more than your share in the respect of our subjects and in protection from ill-treatment. You, therefore, with whom alone we freely share our empire, we now justly require not to betray that empire in its extremity, and in scorn of Corinthians, whom you have often conquered, and of Siceliots, none of whom so much as presumed to stand against us when our navy was in its prime, we ask you to repel them, and to show that, even in sickness and disaster, your skill is more than a match for the fortune and vigour of any other. For the Athenians among you, I add once more this reflection— you left behind you no more such ships in your docks as these, no more heavy infantry in their flower. If you do aught but conquer, our enemies will immediately sail thither, and those that are left of us at Athens will become unable to repel their home assailants, reinforced by these new allies. Here you will fall at once into the hands of the Syracusans. I need not remind you of the intentions with which you attacked them, and your countrymen at home will fall into those of the Lacedaemonians. Since the fate of both thus hangs upon this single battle, now, if ever, stand firm, and remember, each and all, that you who are now going on board are the army and navy of the Athenians, and all that is left of the state and the great name of Athens, in whose defence, if any man has any advantage in skill or courage, now is the time to show it, and thus serve himself, and save all. After this address, Nicias at once gave orders to man the ships. Meanwhile, Gylippus and the Syracusans could perceive, by the preparations which they saw going on, that the Athenians meant to fight at sea. They had also notice of the grappling irons, against which they specially provided by stretching hides over the prows and much of the upper part of their vessels, in order that the irons, when thrown, might slip off without taking hold. All being now ready, the generals and Gylippus addressed them in the following terms. Syracusans and Allies the glorious character of our past achievements, and the no less glorious results at issue in the coming battle are, we think, understood by most of you, or you would never have thrown yourselves with such ardour into the struggle. And if there be any one not as fully aware of the facts as he ought to be, we will declare them to him. The Athenians came to this country, first to effect the conquest of Sicily, and after that, if successful, of Peloponnese and the rest of Hellas, possessing already the greatest empire yet known of present or former times among the Hellenes.
Here for the first time they found in you men who faced their navy which made them masters everywhere. You have already defeated them in the previous sea fights, and will in all likelihood defeat them again now, when men are once checked in what they consider their special excellence. Their whole opinion of themselves suffers more than if they had not at first believed in their superiority, the unexpected shock to their pride causing them to give way more than their real strength warrants, and this is probably now the case with the Athenians. With us it is different. The original estimate of ourselves, which gave us courage in the days of our unskilfulness, has been strengthened, while the conviction superadded to it that we must be the best seamen of the time, if we have conquered the best, has given a double measure of hope to every man among us, and for the most part, where there is the greatest hope, there is also the greatest ardour for action. The means to combat us which they have tried to find in copying our armament are familiar to our warfare and will be met by proper provisions, while they will never be able to have a number of heavy infantry on their decks, contrary to their custom, and a number of darters, born landsmen, one may say, Arcanians and others, embarked afloat, who will not know how to discharge their weapons when they have to keep still, without hampering their vessels, and falling all into confusion among themselves through fighting not according to their own tactics. For they will gain nothing by the number of their ships, I say this to those of you who may be alarmed by having to fight against odds, as a quantity of ships in a confined space will only be slower in executing the movements required, and most exposed to injury from our means of offence. Indeed, if you would know the plain truth, as we are credibly informed, the excess of their sufferings and the necessities of their present distress have made them desperate. They have no confidence in their force, but wish to try their fortune in the only way they can, and either to force their passage and sail out, or after this to retreat by land, it being impossible for them to be worse off than they are. The fortune of our greatest enemies having thus betrayed itself, and their disorder being what I have described, let us engage in anger, convinced that, as between adversaries, nothing is more legitimate than to claim to sate the whole wrath of one's soul in punishing the aggressor, and nothing more sweet, as the proverb has it, than the vengeance upon an enemy which it will now be ours to take. That enemies they are, and mortal enemies, you all know, since they came here to enslave our country, and if successful, had in reserve for our men all that is most dreadful, and for our children and wives all that is most dishonourable and for the whole city the name which conveys the greatest reproach. None should therefore relent or think it gain if they go away without further danger to us. This they will do just the same, even if they get the victory, while if we succeed, as we may expect in chastising them, and in handing down to all Sicily her ancient freedom strengthened and confirmed, we shall have achieved no mean triumph and the rarest dangers are those in which failure brings little loss, and success the greatest advantage. After the above address to the soldiers on their side, the Syracusan generals and Gylippus now perceived that the Athenians were manning their ships, and immediately proceeded to man their own also. Meanwhile Nicias, appalled by the position of affairs, realizing the greatness and nearness of the danger now that they were on the point of putting out from shore, and thinking, as men are apt to think in great crises, that when all has been done they have still something left to do, and when all has been said, that they have not yet said enough, again called on the captains one by one, addressing each by his father's name and by his own, and by that of his tribe, and adjured them not to belie their own personal renown, or to obscure the hereditary virtues for which their ancestors were illustrious. He reminded them of their country, the freest of the free, and of the unfettered discretion allowed in it to all to live as they pleased, and added other arguments such as men would use at such a crisis, and which, with little alteration, are made to serve on all occasions alike, appeals to wives, children, and national gods, without caring whether they are thought commonplace, but loudly invoking them in the belief that they will be of use in the consternation of the moment. Having thus admonished them, not he felt as he would, but as he could, Nicias withdrew and led the troops to the sea, and ranged them in as long a line as he was able, in order to aid as far as possible in sustaining the courage of the men afloat, while Demosthenes, Menander, and Euthydemus, who took the command on board, put out from their camp, and sailed straight to the barrier across the mouth of the harbour, and to the passage left open, to try and force their way out. 
The Syracusans and their allies had already put out with about the same number of ships as before, a part of which kept guard at the outlet, and the remainder all round the rest of the harbour, in order to attack the Athenians on all sides at once, while the land forces held themselves in readiness at the points at which the vessels might put into the shore. The Syracusan fleet was commanded by Sicanus and Agatharchus, who each had a wing of the whole force, with Python and the Corinthians in the centre. When the rest of the Athenians came up to the barrier, with the first shock of their charge they overpowered the ships stationed there, and tried to undo the fastenings. After this, as the Syracusans and allies bore down upon them from all quarters, the action spread from the barrier over the whole harbour, and was more obstinately disputed than any of the preceding ones. On either side the rowers showed great zeal in bringing up their vessels at the boatswain's orders, and the helmsmen great skill in manoeuvring, and great emulation one with another. While the ships, once alongside, the soldiers on board did their best not to let the service on deck be outdone by the others. In short, every man strove to prove himself the first in his particular department. And as many ships were engaged in a small compass, for these were the largest fleets fighting in the narrowest space ever known, being together little short of two hundred, the regular attacks with the beak were few, there being no opportunity of backing water or of breaking the line, while the collisions caused by one ship chancing to run foul of another, either in flying from or attacking a third, were more frequent. So long as a vessel was coming up to the charge, the men on the decks rained darts and arrows and stones upon her. But once alongside, the heavy infantry tried to board each other's vessel, fighting hand to hand. In many quarters it happened, by reason of the narrow room, that a vessel was charging an enemy on one side, and being charged herself on another, and that two or sometimes more ships had perforce got entangled round one, obliging the helmsman to attend to defence here, offence there, not to one thing at once, but to many on all sides, while the huge din caused by the number of ships crashing together not only spread terror, but made the orders of the boatswains inaudible. The boatswains on either side, in the discharge of their duty and in the heat of the conflict, shouted incessantly orders and appeals to their men. The Athenians they urged to force the passage out, and now, if ever, to show their mettle and lay hold of a safe return to their country. To the Syracusans and their allies they cried that it would be glorious to prevent the escape of the enemy, and conquering, to exalt the countries that were theirs. The generals, moreover, on either side, if they saw any in any part of the battle backing ashore without being forced to do so, called out to the captain by name, and asked him, the Athenians, whether they were retreating because they thought the thrice hostile shore more their own than the sea which had cost them so much labour to win, the Syracusans, whether they were flying from the flying Athenians, whom they well knew to be eager to escape in whatever way they could. Meanwhile, the two armies on shore, while victory hung in the balance, were a prey to the most agonising and conflicting emotions, the natives thirsting for more glory than they had already won, while the invaders feared to find themselves in an even worse plight than before. The all of the Athenians being set upon their fleet, their fear for the event was nothing like they had ever felt, while their view of the struggle was necessarily as checkered as the battle itself. Close to the scene of action, and not at all looking at the same point at once, some saw their friends victorious, and took courage, and fell to calling upon heaven not to deprive them of salvation, while others, who had their eyes turned upon the losers, wailed and cried aloud, and although spectators, were more overcome than the actual combatants. Others again were gazing at some spot where the battle was evenly disputed. As the strife was protracted without decision, their swaying bodies reflected the agitation of their minds, and they suffered the worst agony of all, ever just within reach of safety, or just on the point of destruction. In short, in that one Athenian army, as long as the sea-fight remained doubtful, there was every sound to be heard at once, shrieks, cheers, we win, we lose, and all the other manifold exclamations that a great host would necessarily utter in great peril. And with the men in the fleet it was nearly the same, until at last the Syracusans and their allies, after the battle had lasted a long while, put the Athenians to flight, and with much shouting and cheering, chased them in open rout to the shore. The naval force, one one way and one another, as many as were not taken afloat, now ran ashore, and rushed from on board their ships to their camp, 
while the army, no more divided, but carried away by one impulse, all with shrieks and groans deplored the event, and ran down, some to help the ships, others to guard what was left of the wall, while the remaining and most numerous part already began to consider how they should save themselves. Indeed, the panic of the present moment had never been surpassed. They now suffered very nearly what they had inflicted at Pylos, as then the Lacedaemonians, with the loss of their fleet, lost also the men who had crossed over to the island. So now the Athenians had no hope of escaping by land, without the help of some extraordinary accident. The sea-fight having been a severe one, and many ships and lives having been lost on both sides, the victorious Syracusans and their allies now picked up their wrecks and their dead, and sailed off to the city and set up a trophy. The Athenians, overwhelmed by their misfortune, never even thought of asking leave to take up their dead or wrecks, but wished to retreat that very night. Demosthenes, however, went to Nicias, and gave it as his opinion that they should man the ships they had left, and make another effort to force their passage out the next morning. Saying that they still had left more ships fit for service than the enemy, the Athenians having about sixty remaining, as against less than fifty of their opponents. Nicias was quite of his mind, but when they wished to man the vessels the sailors refused to go on board, being so utterly overcome by their defeat as no longer to believe in the possibility of success. Accordingly, they all now made up their minds to retreat by land. Meanwhile, the Syracusan Hermocrates, suspecting their intention, and impressed by the danger of allowing a force of that magnitude to retire by land, establish itself in some other part of Sicily, and from thence renew the war, went and stated his views to the authorities, and pointed out to them that they ought not to let the enemy get away by night, but that all the Syracusans and their allies should at once march out and block up the roads and seize and guard the passes. The authorities were entirely of his opinion, and thought that it ought to be done, but on the other hand felt sure that the people, who had given themselves over to rejoicing, and were taking their ease after a great battle at sea, would not be easily brought to obey. Besides, they were celebrating a festival, having on that day a sacrifice to Heracles, and most of them in their rapture at the victory had fallen to drinking at the festival, and would probably consent to anything sooner than take up their arms and march out at that moment. For these reasons the thing appeared impracticable to the magistrates, and Hermocrates, finding himself unable to do anything further with them, had now recourse to the following stratagem of his own. What he feared was that the Athenians might quietly get the start of them by passing the most difficult places during the night, and he therefore sent, as soon as it was dusk, some friends of his own to the camp with some horsemen, who rode up within earshot and called out to some of the men, as though they were well-wishers of the Athenians, and told them to tell Nicias, who had in fact some correspondents who informed him of what went on inside the town, not to lead off the army by night, as the Syracusans were guarding the roads, but to make his preparations at his leisure, and to retreat by day. After saying this they departed, and their hearers informed the Athenian generals, who put off going that night on the strength of this message, not doubting its sincerity. Since, after all, they had not set out at once, they now determined to stay also the following day to give time to the soldiers to pack up as well as they could the most useful articles, and leaving everything else behind, to start only with what was strictly necessary for their personal subsistence. Meanwhile, the Syracusans and Gylippus marched out and blocked the roads through the country by which the Athenians were likely to pass, and kept guard at the fords of the streams and rivers, posting themselves so as to receive them and stop the army where they thought best, while their fleet sailed up to the beach and towed off the ships of the Athenians. Some few were burned by the Athenians themselves as they had intended, the rest the Syracusans lashed on to their own at their leisure, as they had been thrown up on shore, without any one trying to stop them, and conveyed to the town. After this, Nicias and Demosthenes, now thinking that enough had been done in the way of preparation, the removal of the army took place upon the second day after the sea-fight. It was a lamentable scene, not merely from the single circumstance that they were retreating after having lost all their ships, their great hopes gone, and themselves in the state in peril but also in leaving the camp there were things most grievous for every eye and heart to contemplate. The dead lay unburied, and each man, as he recognized a friend among them, shuddered with grief and horror, while the living whom they were leaving behind, wounded or sick, were to the living far more shocking than the dead, and more to be pitied than those who had perished. 
these fell to entreating and bewailing until their friends knew not what to do, begging them to take them, and loudly calling to each individual comrade or relative whom they could see, hanging upon the necks of their tent-fellows in the act of departure, and following them as far as they could, and when their bodily strength failed them, calling again and again upon heaven, and shrieking aloud as they were left behind, so that the whole army, being filled with tears and distracted after this fashion, found it not easy to go, even from an enemy's land, where they had already suffered evils too great for tears, and in the unknown future before them feared to suffer more. Dejection and self-condemnation were also rife among them. Indeed, they could only be compared to a starved-out town, and that no small one, escaping, the whole multitude upon the march being not less than forty thousand men. All carried anything they could which might be of use, and the heavy infantry and troopers, contrary to their want, while under arms carried their own victuals, in some cases for want of servants, in others through not trusting them, as they had long been deserting, and now did so in greater numbers than ever. Yet even thus they did not carry enough, as there was no longer food in the camp. Moreover, their disgrace generally, and the universality of their sufferings, however to a certain extent alleviated by being born in company, were still felt at the moment a heavy burden, especially when they contrasted the splendour and glory of their setting out with the humiliation in which it had ended. For this was by far the greatest reverse that ever befell a Hellenic army. They had come to enslave others, and were departing in fear of being enslaved themselves, they had sailed out with prayer and pains, and now started to go back with omens directly contrary, travelling by land instead of by sea, and trusting not in their fleet, but in their heavy infantry. Nevertheless, the greatness of the danger still impending made all this appear tolerable. Nicias, seeing the army dejected and greatly altered, passed along the ranks, and encouraged and comforted them as far as was possible under the circumstances, raising his voice still higher and higher, as he went from one company to another in his earnestness, and in his anxiety that the benefit of his words might reach as many as possible. Athenians and Allies Even in our present position we must still hope on, since men have ere now been saved from worse straits than this, and you must not condemn yourselves too severely either because of your disasters, or because of your present unmerited sufferings. I myself, who am not superior to any of you in strength, indeed you see how I am in my sickness, and who in the gifts of fortune am, I think, whether in private life or otherwise, the equal of any, am now exposed to the same danger as the meanest among you. And yet my life has been one of much devotion toward the gods, and of much justice, and without offence toward men. I have, therefore, still a strong hope for the future, and our misfortunes do not terrify me as much as they might. Indeed, we may hope that they will be lightened. Our enemies have had good fortune enough, and if any of the gods was offended at our expedition, we have already been amply punished. Others before us have attacked their neighbours, and have done what men will do without suffering more than they could bear, and we may now justly expect to find the gods more kind, for we have become fitter objects for their pity than their jealousy. And then look at yourselves. Mark the numbers and efficiency of the heavy infantry marching in your ranks, and do not give way too much to despondency, but reflect that you are yourselves at once a city wherever you sit down, and that there is no other in Sicily that could easily resist your attack, or expel you when once established. The safety and order of the march is for yourselves to look to, the one thought of each man being that the spot on which he may be forced to fight must be conquered, and held as his country and stronghold. Meanwhile, we shall hasten on our way night and day alike, as our provisions are scanty, and if we can reach some friendly place of the Sicels, whom fear of the Syracusans still keeps true to us, you may forthwith consider yourselves safe. A message has been sent to them with directions to meet us with supplies of food. To sum up, be convinced, soldiers, that you must be brave, as there is no place near for your cowardice to take refuge in, and that if you now escape from the enemy, you may all see again what your hearts desire, while those of you who are Athenians will raise up again the great power of the state, fallen though it be. Men make the city, and not walls or ships without men in them. As he made this address, Nicias went along the ranks, and brought back to their place any of the troops that he saw straggling out of the line, while Demosthenes did as much for his part of the army, addressing them in words very similar. The army marched in a hollow square, 
the division under Nicias leading, and that of Demosthenes following, the heavy infantry being outside, and the baggage carriers and the bulk of the army in the middle. When they arrived at the ford of the river Anapis, they found drawn up a body of Syracusans and allies, and routing these, made good their passage and pushed on, harassed by the charges of the Syracusan horse and by the missiles of their light troops. On that day they advanced about four miles and a half, halting for the night upon a certain hill. On the next they started early, and got on about two miles further, and descended into a place in the plain, and there encamped, in order to procure some eatables from the houses, as the place was inhabited, and to carry on with them water from thence, as for many furlongs in front, in the direction where they were going, it was not plentiful. The Syracusans, meanwhile, went on, and fortified the pass in front, where there was a steep hill with a rocky ravine on either side of it, called the Acrean Cliff. The next day the Athenians advancing found themselves impeded by the missiles and charges of the horse and darters, both very numerous, of the Syracusans and allies, and after fighting for a long while, at length retired to the same camp, where they no longer had provisions as before, it being impossible to leave their position by reason of the cavalry. Early the next morning they started afresh, and forced their way to the hill, which had been fortified, where they found before them the enemy's infantry drawn up many shields deep to defend the fortification, the pass being narrow. The Athenians assaulted the work, but were greeted by a storm of missiles from the hill, which told with the greater effect through its being a steep one, and unable to force the passage, retreated again and rested. Meanwhile occurred some claps of thunder and rain, as often happens toward autumn, which still further disheartened the Athenians, who thought all these things to be omens of their approaching ruin. While they were resting, Gylippus and the Syracusans sent a part of their army to throw works in the rear on the way by which they had advanced. However, the Athenians immediately sent some of their men and prevented them, after which they retreated more towards the plain and halted for the night. When they advanced the next day, the Syracusans surrounded and attacked them on every side, and disabled many of them, falling back if the Athenians advanced, and coming on if they retired, and in particular assaulting the rear, in the hope of routing them in detail, and thus striking a panic into the whole army. For a long while the Athenians persevered in this fashion, but after advancing for four or five furlongs halted to rest in the plain, the Syracusans also withdrawing to their own camp. During the night Nicias and Demosthenes, seeing the wretched condition of their troops, now in want of every kind of necessary, and numbers of them disabled in the numerous attacks of the enemy, determined to light as many fires as possible, and to lead off the army, no longer by the same route as they had intended, but toward the sea in the opposite direction to that guarded by the Syracusans. The whole of this route was leading the army not to Catana, but to the other side of Sicily, towards Camarina, Jela, and the Hellenic and Barbaric towns in that quarter. They accordingly lit a number of fires and set out by night. Now all armies, and the greatest most of all, are liable to fears and alarms, especially when they are marching by night through an enemy's country, and with the enemy near. And the Athenians falling into one of these panics, the leading division, that of Nicias, kept together and got on a good way in front, while that of Demosthenes, comprising rather more than half the army, got separated and marched on in some disorder. By morning, however, they reached the sea, and getting into the Hellarine road, pushed on in order to get to the river Cassiparus, and to follow the stream up through the interior, where they hoped to be met by the Sicels whom they had sent for. Arrived at the river, they found there also a Syracusan party, engaged in barring the passage of the river, and went on to another called the Irenaeus, according to the advice of their guides. Meanwhile, when day came, and the Syracusans and allies found that the Athenians were gone, most of them accused Gylippus of having let them escape on purpose, and hastily pursuing by the road which they had no difficulty in finding that they had taken, overtook them about dinner-time. They first came up with the troops under Demosthenes, who were behind, and marching somewhat slowly and in disorder, owing to the night panic above referred to, and at once attacked and engaged them, the Syracusan horse surrounding them with more ease now that they were separated from the rest, and hemming them in one spot. The division of Nicias was five or six miles on in front, as he led them more rapidly, thinking that under the circumstances their safety lay not in staying and fighting, unless obliged, but in retreating as fast as possible, and only fighting when forced to do so. 
On the other hand, Demosthenes was generally speaking harassed more incessantly, as his post in the rear left him the first exposed to the attacks of his enemy, and now, finding that the Syracusans were in pursuit, he omitted to push on, in order to form his men for battle, and so lingered until he was surrounded by his pursuers, and himself and the Athenians with him placed in the most distressing position, being huddled into an enclosure with a wall all around it, a road on this side and on that, and olive-trees in great number, where missiles were showered in upon them from every quarter. This mode of attack the Syracusans had with good reason adopted in preference to fighting at close quarters, as to risk a struggle with desperate men was now more for the advantage of the Athenians than for their own. Besides, their success had now become so certain that they began to spare themselves a little in order not to be cut off in the moment of victory, thinking, too, that, as it was, they would be able in this way to subdue and capture the enemy. In fact, after plying the Athenians and allies all day long from every side with missiles, they at length saw that they were worn out with their wounds and other sufferings, and Gylippus and the Syracusans and their allies made a proclamation, offering their liberty to any of the islanders who chose to come over to them, and some few cities went over. Afterwards, a capitulation was agreed upon for all the rest with Demosthenes to lay down their arms on condition that no one was to be put to death, either by violence or imprisonment, or want of the necessaries of life. Upon this they surrendered to the number of six thousand in all, laying down all the money in their possession, which filled the hollows of four shields, and were immediately conveyed by the Syracusans to the town. Meanwhile Nicias, with his division, arrived that day at the river Arenaeus, crossed over, and posted his army on some high ground upon the other side. The next day the Syracusans overtook him, and told him that the troops under Demosthenes had surrendered, and invited him to follow their example. Incredulous of the fact, Nicias asked for a truce to send a horseman to sea, and upon the return of the messenger with the tidings that they had surrendered, sent a herald to Gylippus and the Syracusans, saying that he was ready to agree with them on behalf of the Athenians to repay whatever money the Syracusans had spent upon the war if they would let his army go, and offered, until the money was paid, to give Athenians as hostages, one for every talent. The Syracusans and Gylippus rejected this proposition, and attacked this division as they had the others, standing all around and plying them with missiles until the evening. Food and necessaries were as miserably wanting to the troops of Nicias as they had been to their comrades. Nevertheless they watched for the quiet of the night to resume their march. But as they were taking up their arms the Syracusans perceived it, and raised their paean, upon which the Athenians, finding that they were discovered, laid them down again except about three hundred men, who forced their way through the guards, and went on during the night as they were able. As soon as it was day, Nicias put his army in motion, pressed, as before, by the Syracusans and their allies, pelted from every side by their missiles, and struck down by their javelins. The Athenians pushed on for the Asinaris, impelled by the attacks made upon them from every side by a numerous cavalry and the swarm of other arms, fancying that they should breathe more freely if once across the river, and driven on also by their exhaustion and craving for water. Once there they rushed in, and all order was at an end, each man wanting to cross first, and the attacks of the enemy making it difficult to cross at all. Forced to huddle together, they fell against and trod down one another some dying immediately upon the javelins, others getting entangled together and stumbling over the articles of baggage without being able to rise again. Meanwhile, the opposite bank, which was steep, was lined by the Syracusans, who showered missiles down upon the Athenians, most of them drinking greedily and heaped together in disorder in the hollow bed of the river. The Peloponnesians also came down and butchered them, especially those in the water, which was thus immediately spoiled, but which they went on drinking just the same, mud and all, bloody as it was, most even fighting to have it. At last, when many dead now lay piled upon one another in the stream, and part of the army had been destroyed at the river, and the few that escaped from thence cut off by the cavalry, Nicias surrendered himself to Gylippus, whom he trusted more than he did the Syracusans, and told him and the Lacedaemonians to do what they liked with him, but to stop the slaughter of the soldiers. Gylippus, after this, immediately gave orders to make prisoners, upon which the rest were brought together alive, except a large number secreted by the soldiery, and a party was sent in pursuit of the three hundred who had got through the guard during the night, and who were now taken with the rest.' 
The number of the enemy collected as public property was not considerable, but that secreted was very large, and all Sicily was filled with them, no convention having been made in their case as for those taken with Demosthenes. Besides this, a large portion were killed outright, the carnage being very great, and not exceeded by any in this Sicilian war. In the numerous other encounters upon the march, not a few also had fallen. Nevertheless, many escaped, some at the moment, others served as slaves, and then ran away subsequently. These found refuge at Catana. The Syracusans and their allies now mustered and took up the spoils and as many prisoners as they could, and went back to the city. The rest of their Athenian and allied captives were deposited in the quarries, this seeming the safest way of keeping them. But Nicias and Demosthenes were butchered, against the will of Gylippus, who thought that it would be the crown of his triumph if he could take his enemy's generals to Lacedaemon. One of them, as it happened, Demosthenes, was one of her greatest enemies, on account of the affair of the island and of Pylos, while the other, Nicias, was for the same reason one of her greatest friends, owing to his exertions to procure the release of the prisoners by persuading the Athenians to make peace. For these reasons the Lacedaemonians felt kindly toward him, and it was in this that Nicias himself mainly confided when he surrendered to Gylippus. But some of the Syracusans, who had been in correspondence with him, were afraid, it was said, of his being put to the torture, and troubling their success by his revelations. Others, especially of the Corinthians, of his escaping, as he was wealthy, by means of bribes, and living to do them further mischief, and these persuaded the allies, and put him to death. This or the like was the cause of the death of a man, who of all the Hellenes in my time least deserved such a fate, seeing that the whole course of his life had been regulated with strict attention to virtue. The prisoners in the quarries were at first hardly treated by the Syracusans. Crowded in a narrow hole, without any roof to cover them, the heat of the sun and the stifling closeness of the air tormented them during the day, and then the nights, which came on autumnal and chilly, made them ill by the violence of the change. Besides, as they had to do everything in the same place for want of room, and the bodies of those who died of their wounds or from the variation in the temperature or from similar causes were left heaped together upon one another, intolerable stenches arose, while hunger and thirst never ceased to afflict them, each man during eight months having only half a pint of water and a pint of corn given him daily. In short, no single suffering to be apprehended by men thrust into such a place was spared them. For some seventy days they thus lived all together, after which all except the Athenians and any Siceliots or Italiots who had joined in the expedition were sold. The total number of prisoners taken it would be difficult to state exactly, but it could not have been less than seven thousand. This was the greatest Hellenic achievement of any in this war, or, in my opinion, in Hellenic history, at once most glorious to the victors and most calamitous to the conquered. They were beaten at all points and all together. All that they suffered was great. They were destroyed, as the saying is, with total destruction. Their fleet, their army, everything was destroyed, and few out of the many returned home. Such were the events in Sicily. End of Book 7 Chapter 23